Hello, and welcome to Latin 3 Honors. I'm really excited that you guys signed up for a third year. Um, in case you're having any qualms about it, just to remind you, most colleges really, really, really require now a third year of the same foreign language. Um, I know UGA, for example, will not really even consider your application if you only have two years. So you're definitely doing the right thing uh, in terms of college. But uh, more importantly, uh, it's just a lot of fun. Latin 3 is the year where everything kind of comes together. Some of you are probably freaking out because, you know, we basically covered two years of Latin in one year last year. And you're thinking to yourself, I've completely forgotten most of what I learned last year. It was just so much information just crammed into one year. And now there's the summer and now we're starting and ah, I'm freaking out. But it's okay. Don't worry. This is the year where we tend to slow down just a little bit. The grammar is not quite as intensive. Um, we tend to focus a lot on uh, learning more in depth about the culture and way of life of the Romans. You're going to learn a lot more history and story time uh, than you did last year. And by the end of this year, I guarantee you something will just click. Um, usually it happens sometime around October, November of fall semester, as we're reading through stories, uh, people start to say to themselves, well, wait a minute, you know, this isn't really that bad. Um, I, I finally kind of understand the passive voice and I understand the subjunctive. Um, so don't fret. Um, it's okay. Everything will be okay. Nil desperandum. That's a Latin famous phrase you're going to learn. In stage 26, it means uh, basically don't despair. Nothing is to be despaired of. Um, so where are we headed? Well, um, I'm going to review the storyline in a few minutes. But essentially what we're going to do uh, during the fall semester is uh, we're going to finish up our time in Britain and move on to Rome, where everything is not okay in the Emperor Domitian's household. Dun, 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 dun. And we're going to finish the green book, get into the purple book next semester, and we'll probably make it through about stage 40. And that's where uh, the Quintus story ends. And that'll be a nice stopping point for the end of the year. If we do have time at the very end of the year, we'll do a poetry unit. Um, from stages 42 and 45, but we never seem to, to quite get there. Um, in terms of story time, uh, we are going to basically focus on the Roman Republic this year. We, co we covered the monarchy last year, and don't worry, I've got a video to kind of review the high points of what happened during the monarchy. Uh, and this year, we're going to focus on the years 509 BCE all the way down, hopefully to the year 27 BCE, which is when um, a guy named Octavian changes his name to Augustus and becomes Rome's first emperor. So that, that period, 509 to 27, encompasses the Roman Republic. Lots of weird and bizarre stories this year, um, for sure. Now, even though I said a few minutes ago that... This is the year where we kind of slow down and look at things more in depth. I must admit that while I am gone on paternity leave, I'm segueing into the next bullet point, paternity leave and expectations, um, I'm going to push you and uh, there's going to be a lot of work to do. We're going we're gonna to cover the first unit, which uh, is uh, consists of stages 26, 27, and 28. Basically, that whole unit will be done while I am gone. But... I have created lots of videos uh, and I'm posting them to Blackboard so that you guys can keep up as much as possible. I'm also going to be uh, sort of getting a lot of feedback from the substitute about how you guys are doing. I'm going to ask you guys yourselves to, um, to rate your performance and your understanding of certain concepts throughout the unit. And even though I'm at home taking care of a newborn, uh, I will try my best to figure out a way to address some of the questions or concerns that you guys might have, um, probably by making some uh, additional videos and posting them to Blackboard so you guys can watch them. Um, the s I will be gone from the beginning of the school year until Labor Day. And the long-term sub, her name is Mrs. Olympia Jenkins. And some of you recognize Miss Jenkins uh, because she 
has been a substitute here fairly regularly over the last several years. She's actually a retired Grady English and language arts teacher, um, and she is amazing. Now, I do have some expectations. I do expect you, as always, to be on time to class. I expect you to be prepared. I expect you to be respectful of each other and certainly of Miss Jenkins. And I expect that you will treat her better than you treat me. And you guys treat me very, very well. Um, I expect you to do the work that I assign you um, and to be willing and open to, uh, to this experiment that we have here where I'm trying to sort of teach you uh, online. I know it's not ideal or conducive, but at the same time, I'm not just gonna let you guys do nothing for six weeks. Um, so we're gonna try our best to see how this works. And I think, it will, I think it will work. I expect you to pick up after yourself, not litter in the classroom. And as usual, never ever stand by the door. It makes me nervous. And even though I'm not here, I will know if you're standing by the door because I will feel a tinge of nervousness within me no matter where I am. So don't stand by the door. Okay, so there are a couple of things I wanted to let you know of in terms of quizzes and, and, uh, and your test. Um, again, stages 26 through 28 will be the first unit. It focuses on the Roman military and also uh, a little bit about archeology span is thrown in there towards the end in stage 28. In terms of your test, it's tentatively scheduled for um, August 31st. It'll be that week, August 31st through September 4th. Sometime during that week is when you will take your first unit test. In terms of quizzes, you will have vocab quizzes over stages 26, 27, and 28. And you're also going to have some other quizzes. This is new this year, something I've decided to add, which I think will help. Um, I'm going to add in some grammar quizzes and story time quizzes as well for my own sanity um, because I will be col I'm going to be collecting um, the work that you guys do and the quizzes uh, and I will grade them and put them in the grade book. I don't know how the, exactly that's going to work. I think I'm probably going to stop by um, every Friday afternoon after school just to pick up that week's work and I'll go home and grade it uh, in my spare time, probably in the wee hours of the morning, and uh, put it in the grade book so that, you know, at least you have an idea of how you're doing. So in order for me to uh, remain sane, um, your vocabulary quizzes, your grammar quizzes, your story time quizzes, at least for this first unit, all of them will be multiple choice and done by Scantron. Um, that will probably change. The vocab quizzes will go back to the old way once I return. And I'm not sure about grammar and story time. I, I might keep them as multiple choice. I'm, we'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. Um, uh, Miss Jenkins will kind of let you know exactly when the vocab quizzes and the grammar quizzes and story time quizzes are, um, but you could probably take a guess um, that you know, you'll be watching a video, for example, on say stage 26 grammar, and then a couple of classes later, after you've gotten a chance to practice it, bam, you'll have a grammar quiz. Okay, um, and I already told you uh, when your test will be. Something else is going to be new this year. Uh, it should be in your syllabus, and um, I want you to really pay attention to the rubric for classwork and participation. Now, Ms. Jenkins uh, is a professional. As I mentioned earlier, she taught for 30 some odd years and a lot of those years were here at Grady. Um, she was well beloved by her students and respected. And I, as a professional, uh, she can certainly judge uh, very accurately if you guys are doing the classwork and participating. Um, so whatever she decides to uh, give you in terms of a participation slash classwork grade, for, uh, for the week, I will honor that judgment on her part. So pay attention to the rubric and, um, and she will certainly be monitoring you guys on that. Um, in terms of the storyline, I don't know if you guys remember, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, I don't, I just seem to remember something about, you know, a, s a soldier who was kind of dumb, maybe he had a partner, et cetera, et cetera. Well, just to give you a brief 
recap of last year. So at the end of the Red Book, you know that Vesuvius blew up and Quintus survived, as did Clemens. And uh, Quintus at first went to Egypt and Alexandria with Clemens. And you guys remember the whole gang warfare situation that happened there and the sacred cat and all that kind of craziness and Eutychus and his goons. Well, after a while, Quintus left Alexandria um, and he was told by a friend of his named Barbilis, um, who died at the end of the Blue Book, uh, Barbilis had a son named Rufus, who was a soldier stationed in Britain, and Barbilis and Rufus had had a falling out. And Barbilis, on his deathbed, asked Quintus, please go find Rufus and give him this letter. And um, that explains, of course, why Quintus went to Britain. So he goes to Britain, and he stays with his aunt and uncle. His uncle's a guy named Sawius who happens to be the lieutenant governor of the entire province of Britain. And they're staying in the kingdom of Cogadubnus, and he's a client king, meaning he keeps his title as king, uh, but really Sawius and the Romans are kind of calling the shots behind the scenes. Well, Cogadubnus, uh, if you'll recall, kind of randomly gets uh, attacked by a bear. Um, that involved a, a two other guys named Norix and Bolemicus, and um, who are sort of rivals, and you might remember the boat race and all that. Anyway, uh, Quintus saves Cogadubnus's life by spearing the bear before it attacks Kogi Bear, and uh, Quintus and Cogadubnus become close friends. Well, meanwhile, for reasons that we are unsure of, as for right now, it will become clearer a little bit later on in the. Uh, in the purple book, actually, um, Sawius decides that he wants Cogadubnus dead. So he goes to the um, to a guy named Memor and convinces Memor to poison Kogi Bear. And if you'll recall, uh, Memor's freedman, Cephalus, tries to poison Cogadubnus, but Quintus recognizes the poisoned cup from his days in Egypt and knocks it out of uh, Cogadubnus' hands at just the last minute. Um, at that point, uh, Cogadubnus and uh, Sawius have a huge argument, and Sawius basically says, I'm taking over your kingdom, and, um, and that's that, and I order you to be arrested. And at the very end of where we were last year, Cogadubnus had been arrested, and uh, Quintus and Dumnorix decided that they were going to try and go to the other part of Britain, the farthest part of Britain, to seek out a guy named Agricola, who happens to be the governor of the entire province of Britain. He's the only one, besides the emperor, who outranks Sawius. Sawius is like the lieutenant governor. And they want to go to Agricola and say, hey, you've got to put a stop to this. This isn't right. Sawius has imprisoned Cogadubnus um, falsely uh, with false charges and tried to kill him as well. Well, Sawius finds out that Quintus and Dunorix have, uh, are, are trying to get to Agricola, so he sends Bolemicus, that's Dunorix's big rival. Bolemicus, by the way, is the dude with the Fu Manchu mustache, the one who trained the bear and all that, lost the boat race. Anyway, um, Bolemicus and his goons go in search of Quintus and Dunorix, and they find them in the woods, and there's a big fight. And Dumnorix is killed, and Quintus escapes, but he's gravely wounded. And that's the last that we heard. Now, there's an alternate storyline, if you'll recall, about two Roman soldiers um, who are both kind of idiots. One is Modestus, and he's kind of uh, a portly gentleman and uh, very full of himself. And the other is Strithio and Strithio is just kind of along for the ride, likes to make fun of Modestus. Neither one is very bright. If you'll recall, um, at the, there were some hijinks involving a, a woman named Wilbia and, um, and her ex-boyfriend Bulbus, and there was some cross-dressing involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then at the very end, in stage 25, I believe it was, um, Strithio and Modestus were ordered to guard a jail. And um, they were ordered to guard a particular prisoner in the jail named Wercobrix. And he was a local chieftain whom the Romans had been looking for for a long time. 
well. Modestus went into the cell for some reason and was waving his sword around, cursing at Werkabrix. And if you'll recall, uh, Werkabrix didn't hear any of it because he was asleep. And then, then a spider fell on Modestus' face. And Modestus went out of the jail cell and he was freaked out. And he didn't want to admit that to Strithio. So he said, I'm going to go to the kitchen and get something to eat. And when he came back, the uh, door of the cell was open and he found Strithio inside, but Werkobrix was gone, as were all the other prisoners. And so Strithio and Modestus freak out and they decide uh, in order not to get punished that they too must escape. So they run out of the cell. So that was the end of that story as well. Um, stage 26 will be uh, mostly about Agricola and uh, his confrontation with Sawius and Quintus is involved as well. Uh, stage 27, we get back to Modestus and Strithio. Uh, and then stage 28 is further on about more about Sawius and uh, Agricola and Quintus and all of their uh, interactions. So that is a review of the storyline. And um, now let's do a quick review of the subjunctive. So I wanted to cover the subjunctive because that was the last thing that we covered in stages 24 and 25. And if you look back through your notes, if you'll recall, um, there are three moods or three ways of expressing the, the, the action of a verb. Um, there are imperatives as in number one, clean up that mess. There are um, what are called indicative statements. That's what we say in Latin. In English, we call them declarative. And those are statements of fact um, factuality or actuality as in number two, hey, this morning I made a mess. And then there are statements like number three, I might clean up that mess. Um, that is a subjunctive statement. Subjunctive expresses hypothetical situations, um, hesitancy, doubt, or it could also express, um, you know, vagueness or potential action, something along those lines. Now, um, last year, and really for a good chunk of this year until we get to the purple book, um, you only need to know two tenses of the subjunctive, and those are the imperfect tense and the pluperfect tense. And for this year, um, pretty much you only need to know the subjunctive as it is used in dependent clauses. And we covered two last year, and we're going to cover about four or five more this year. Now, um, the two tenses of the, of the subjunctive that we have to know are imperfect and pluperfect. Just as a reminder, for the imperfect subjunct subjunctive, you take the infinitive, that's the second part of the verb, it always ends in R-E, as in amare, A-M-A-R-E, and then you simply add one of these present tense verb endings, uh, M-S-T, mustis, unt. Um, remember your present tense song? Um, the only difference here is the first person singular. It's M as opposed to O, but everywhere else it's normal. S means you, T means he, she, it. Moose means we, tis means y'all, and T means they. And then um, if you'll recall, there really is no difference in the way an imperfect subjunctive is translated as opposed to like a normal old bomb, boss, bot imperfect verb. Um, the only difference is in how they're being used in the sentence. An imperfect that ends in bomb, boss, bot will be used in a sentence that is expressing a fact. An imperfect uh, subjunctive will be used in one of those dependent clauses that expresses mm, some kind of vagueness or potential action or a hypothetical. Okay. And then the pluperfect subjunctive, this is easier to spot because it always has SSE add it to the third part of the verb, and then it will be followed by one of these endings, MST, mustis, und. And same deal. It's still translated as had verbed, just like a, you know, normal indicative pluperfect. Um, once again, the only difference uh, is in the spelling, and the subjunctive spelling is when it's used in a dependent clause to express some sort of vagueness. And the uh, indicative spelling is used when it's... Uh, expressing a fact or an actual statement. So there is what the verb amo, amari, amawi looks like 
in the pluperfect subjunctive. See how it has the SSE everywhere. Uh, and then we got to uh, last year, there were two types of clauses in which a subjunctive would be used. And the first is called a circumstantial clause, again, describing the general circumstances. And um, I underline cum, of course, because circumstantial clauses always start with cum, and cum here means when. So, for example, they're cum custodes dormirent, when the guards were sleeping. That doesn't tell us exactly at what moment. Uh, could be hours that the guards were sleeping. They could have been sleeping eight hours, and at some point during that eight hours, the prisoners escaped. Um, so there's a little bit of, of vagueness there. Now, the second use was called an indirect question. An indirect question, uh, that's where the question is referred to but not asked directly. In other words, a direct question would be, um, who are you? And the indirect question would be this. Mr. Allen asked who he was. Who he was is the indirect question. Um, now, how do you recognize one in Latin? Well, it's pretty easy because a question word or interrogative word, whatever you want to call it, will start off the clause. And then, of course, the verb after the interrogative word will be in the subjunctive. So I gave you uh, two examples there. Udex me rogavit ubi fures pecuniam in venisent. The judge asked me where the thieves had found the money. That's an indirect question. The direct question would be where did the thieves find the money? So there you have it. That was just a review of the subjunctive and an intro to Latin 3. Uh, go on and watch the next video, which is the stage 26 grammar, in which you will learn a third dependent clause, uh, a third dependent use of the subjunctive. Okay, thank you.